All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined by Shannon Lohr, who is actually a neighbor of mine up the road. We could have done this down by the beach today. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been nice? I don't know about the microphone set up there, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. And Shannon works with entrepreneurs from all over the globe to launch sustainable and ethical fashion brands the right way from the start. And that's what we're going to talk about today is starting a sustainable fashion brand. So uh, I guess let's let's kind of bottom line it with some definitions. When you say uh, sustainable and ethical fashion brand, what do you mean? Yeah, it's a very nuanced uh, term because um, it's taken on a bit of it, a life of its own. Um, back when I was starting in this industry, you didn't even use the words sustainable and fashion together. It would have been like an oxymoron mm -hmm. to use those two words together. But now it um, really refers to thinking about the supply chain, the way your clothes are made in a way that uses potentially sustainable fabrics, natural fibers, recycled fibers, upcycled fabrics. Um, and then when we talk about the ethical manufacturing side, we think about um, factories that pay their workers <laughs> a fair and living mm -hmm. wage. Um, and then there's also life cycle, packaging, all those other good, good things that go into making a product uh, more sustainable for the planet. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I mean, it's uh, it, so what you're doing is helping people f figure out this whole maze. Because if you if you like, because there's so many moving parts to it. I mean, the other day I was, to be honest, I was in a Seven Eleven or something or Circle K, and I saw this bar of chocolate that looked very interesting, and I bought it, and it turned out that it was. Um, it was trying to uh, reform the chocolate industries because apparently there's a lot of coca plantations where there's indentured servitude, if not outright slavery. Yes, yes. And you see that across many industries, um, chocolate, coffee, and then definitely fashion. Um, so we have about 27 million slaves like actual mm -hmm. slaves in the world today, um, which you don't think about modern day slavery. But um, yeah, it's it's a complicated conversation to have. Yeah. Um, so how do you how do you go and figure this out for, for the people who work with you? I mean, how do you figure out where to source all of that? I mean, you've obviously done all of the homework. So how long did it take you to figure out all the different moving parts and to make sure that it was both sustainable and ethical? Because that seems like, as I said, I mean, there's so many moving parts in that supply chain. Yeah, well, and, and that's the thing. It started with me trying to do it myself. So I was starting my own uh, fashion brand back in 2010. I wanted to do it in a way that was sustainably and ethically made, but I didn't really know what that meant. Um, I started diving into the research. I was talking to farmers in Missouri and, and professors in Texas and eco-friendly supermodels in Brooklyn and just kind of getting the, all my feelers out there. And what I realized was fashion is a very, very problematic industry. Um, and so what I did uh, back then was localize the supply chain. So all of our fabric, materials, manufacturing, packaging, everything was sourced within a 50 mile radius in the US, mm. which at the time was pretty unheard of. Um, we yeah. worked with a factory in North Carolina um, that paid its workers a fair and living wage. Um, we sourced compostable packaging, all of our fabrics were either recycled or organic. Our buttons were natural wood. So really, we we were purists when it came to the supply chain. But we, we also realized that took a lot of work. It was really hard to break into the industry. And I, and I wanted to make it easier for startup fashion brands to be able to do the same, to be, uh, you know, an inherently good business model from the start. So uh, that's what led me to do what I do today, which is Factory 45. And, and I help walk brands through the entire setup of going from idea to launch. So if somebody so if somebody's thinking or watching this and saying, wow, that sounds fascinating. I'd love to do a fashion brand and this sounds great. Um, what, what, are, what are some of the questions they should ask themselves before embarking on this journey? 
what problem are you solving for your customer? So the fashion industry is crowded. It is competitive, especially for startup brands who are probably bootstrapping. They don't have the venture capital behind them. Um, they don't have endless amounts of resources and money. So really the fastest way to find your customer and, um, you know, come out into the market is by knowing what problem you're solving for a niche customer. So that's the first thing is really identifying who is your niche ideal customer and, and what problem are you solving for them? Um, the other part of it is looking at it as audience building first, production after. Mm. So this is something that I teach a pre-sale strategy so that you are essentially pre-selling your product before you create any inventory. And that's a whole other sustainability conversation, you know, not creating something and putting more product out into the world that's just gonna sit in a warehouse because it can't be sold. So those are the two things um, I would say to start. Um, and then there's all the other, mm -hmm. you know, things in between. Yeah. So if you do, okay. So if you, if you figure out something like that, because one of the things that interests me now is, I mean, I take, I've got a 17 year old son, right? So I take it. I mean, the, the brands and stuff that they go after, a lot of those are small you know, ones done by influencers on you. I mean, there's a whole other world of fashion and they do limited runs and all of that kind of stuff and they sell out. So there's, so to your point, I mean, figuring out which part of the market you're going after and what's your, what's your niche, what's your strategy, because there's, as you said, it's, it's a massively, it's a massively, uh, uh, it's a huge market. There's a lot of people in there and the barriers to entry have come down a lot. So, uh, so when you're talking about maybe coming up with an idea to solve a problem, like most people who are probably thinking of starting a fashion brand are saying, well, just clothes that look cool, but that's not going to cut it, right? <laughs> uh, I like I like to dig a little deeper. Um, yeah. I think uh, so often, yes, I get pushback from from our entrepreneurs. I don't I don't know what problem I solve. You know, I I just want to make cool clothing, but like at the end of the day there is something that you are solving. Like if you dig deep enough, there is some aspirational goal or a feeling, or there's some, some sort of problem you're solving for your customer. And again, the more specific you can get with your customer, especially when you're first starting out, like niche down, really identify who that ideal target customer is, then the problems that you're solving, the solutions that you're coming up with are going to be a lot easier to identify. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then once once you say, okay, you've got the motivation, you've got the the niche you're going after, you've you've got the idea. Um, what's what's the next step? How do you help people go from there, from that idea into actual production and bringing something to market? Yeah. So one of the first things we do is sourcing, um, sourcing fabric and materials. Really starting to set up your supply chain because the fabric and the materials are the thing that always takes the longest. Um, people are always so surprised how long it can take to find the mm -hmm. perfect fabric you need. So that's what we start with. Um, then we go into audience building, like I said, building an audience before you launch so that you have customers waiting to buy. Um, the last thing I want is someone to launch a product out into the world and they didn't do any marketing before um, and they don't have anybody waiting kind of on their email list or in their social media channels um, or text message lists, wherever they are, those need to be built up in advance. Um, then we go into product development and manufacturing. So figuring out how to get your sample made, how to get your pattern made. Um, I connect people with vetted pattern makers and sample makers, um, and then eventually factories to do the full production run. And then we go into e-commerce marketing. And then eventually the last part of that is creating a pre-sales campaign, whether that is on a site like Kickstarter, another crowdfunding platform, or pre-sales through your own e-commerce site like Shopify. Um, mm. And so essentially raising money before you invest, or actually you don't invest your own money, your customers <laughs> are paying uh, your production run for you. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating because, uh, you know, let's, uh, 
because let's face it, I mean, one of the questions people would have is like, okay, this sounds great, but it sounds like it could be prohibitively expensive. I mean, obviously, that's why people go the cheaper routes and source their stuff from wherever they get it mm -hmm. and um, don't really think about the origins of it. So in in terms of, of the cost to the entrepreneur of setting all of this up, um, what's that like? So it really is so much less than it was even like in, mm -hmm. you know, in 2014, fashionista.com released a report that it took a million dollars to start wow. a new fashion brand. And it, that's just not the case anymore. Um, you can really like, uh, I mean, even to your point, like the barrier to entry is much lower now. Um, even if you do it yourself, you're not drop shipping or, you know, mm -hmm. um, whole, like doing wholesale screen printing or anything. Um, so I to tell people you're, you know, you need a few thousand dollars to invest in samples and patterns, but really I would say like about $5,000 to start. Wow. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, as you say, the, the barriers to entry have come down, the cost has come down. Uh, absolutely. Um, what is the other, what are one of the things when you work with, uh, with entrepreneurs, what, what are some of the things that surprise them, especially somebody who's going into fashion for the first time or building a brand? What are some of the things that kind of you, you think surprise them or, or they didn't really think about it before? Um, that they have to talk about their idea before it's out into the world. Like I, it's so funny how often people are say to me, you know, Shannon, how can I talk about my idea on social media or to my email list? I don't even have pictures of it yet. I don't have samples yet. Um, you have to start talking about your idea. You have to start getting customer feedback, asking questions of your ideal target co customer, having those conversations because that's what's going to make your product better. And as you go into product development and you start creating patterns and samples, you want to have that real-time feedback. You want to have those survey answers from your ideal target customer. So, um, you know, again, like the barrier to entry is so low with social media. You can put a poll up on Instagram in three seconds and get feedback on which color people want, you know, which colorway of fabric people want mm -hmm. or which buttons they like better. So all of that sort of market research, I think, is often uh, pushed kind of to the wayside or, or procrastinated on because we have imposter syndrome or we get scared or, you yep. know, we, we don't want to uh, someone to steal our idea. That's a big one too. Like people are afraid of copycats and competition. And, and so that's really like the main thing is you have to start talking about your idea as soon as you're ready to hit go on it. Yeah, I know. I think that's a, I think a great point and, and imposter syndrome. Yeah. That's something that uh, absolutely, absolutely impacts a lot of people as does uh, not just fear of failure, but fear of success too. That's another one that people often overlook. But it's really interesting there, there what you said about you know getting the market feedback because that is the most difficult thing, isn't it? it to some people, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be fashion. It can be in product development of any kind. Is when you have an idea and it's your baby, and then you say, "Oh, Shannon, here, let me share my ideas," and you start to give me constructive feedback, but I immediately go, mm, "Well, you know, I get into defensive mode because." That's, yes. that's not the way I would have done it. So how do you how do you help people through that phase? Because I can see why people might might kind of push that aside because we might not always like the feedback we get. Yeah, I think it just comes with practice, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. Even you know, I've been doing this for ten plus years, and it's you know can still be hard to get feedback. But the more you look for it, the more you you know, I always say you have to detach yourself from your business. We so often, especially in the beginning, are so married to our idea that we are our idea, right? Like mm -hmm. we are our business and we don't have that like healthy separation that no, your identity is not wrapped up in this, the success or the failure of this business. Um, it took me many years to realize that. And I think when I was able to say, okay, I'm not my business, I run my business, then that whole kind of attitude shift changed where it didn't, you know, it didn't affect me as much the imposter syndrome or the self doubt, right. all of that. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And then how do you help people? Because people get excited about the idea, excited about 
you know, doing all the groundwork, launching. And then sometimes you know, everything takes a bit longer than one would like. Mm -hmm. That just generally happens to be true. And in entrepreneurial pursuits often does as well. But but maintaining the motivation when you get when you hit the first speed bump or when things are taking mm -hmm. a little longer or how, how do you help people get over that? Because that can be oftentimes when that the imposter syndrome comes in or whatever, and they say, oh, I should never even start at this. It's never going to work. Yeah, I think that's kind of the beauty of a program like Factory 45. So mm -hmm. the people that I work with, we it's it's a uh, infrastructure of accountability. There is one-on-one um, -on -one mentorship. So everyone is matched with a mentor who has already graduated from the program, has graduated from Factory 45, launched their brand, is currently running their brand. So you're you're getting mentorship from someone who is doing exactly what you want to be doing. And they can say, oh yeah, I remember when that happened to me, or like, I remember when my fabric fell through and I didn't have a backup fabric. Here's what I did. Having that sort of camaraderie, accountability, coaching, support of people who have done it before, I think there is really nothing more valuable than that. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I think that's that's fantastic because, yeah, because we all, I mean, the thing is people often overlook is we all need an independent third party who's just purely invested in our success no other agenda no nothing anything. and that's why i always think like what you're doing with factory 50 45 and uh you know what other people do with mentoring maybe it's in sales what it doesn't matter what is is go find coaches go find coaches because you you'll, you'll probably have coaches for all of your your hobbies but you know why find a, find a coach for the thing that puts bread on your table so i think that's one of the most critical things is to, to to find mentors and people who've done it and you've programmatized it so that's even better yeah and i think that you know we so often like think as entrepreneurs like oh well like i can't join a program or i can't i don't need a coach like i just have to get scrappy and figure this out on my own and yes you do need to get scrappy mm -hmm. but the, but if you want to get there faster and more efficiently and actually without wasting as much time and money as you would without a coach or a program. I mean, I've had coaches and programs my entire career. I have a business coach now. Like every every year I elevate my coaching and that's what everyone else should be doing too. It, it will serve you so much farther uh, as, as you grow into entrepreneurship. No, no, 100%. So just uh, quickly at the end, um, share a couple of success stories from, from some of the people and brands that you've helped. Yeah. Um, so, hmm, what I, well, what, the first one that comes to mind just did a um, collaboration with Madewell, which is a very, very well-known uh, fashion brand, but they do, it's Gallimar, they do sustainable swimwear. So that was cool to see just like this really big household name, Madewell, partner mm -hmm. with a very, you know, a, a smaller independent sustainable swimwear brand. Um, VETA is another one. This is actually a VETA sweater. Um, they, V-E-T-T-A, um, they're based out of LA, LA and um, they do mini capsule collections. So five pieces that can make up 30 different outfits, um, which is really cool from a minimalist and sustainability standpoint. Um, there are a bunch of success stories, too, on the alumni stories page mm -hmm. of the Factory 45 website. And then we also have an ethical fashion marketplace where we sell some of the brands that have launched through Factory 45. That's at market45.co. Yeah, listen, that's fantastic. Uh, uh, absolutely. So all of uh, all of Shannon's information is going to be below this video. Uh, but before we go, I mean, we've talked a lot about it, but please do tell people again how they can learn more and, and sign up for your program. Sure. Yeah, you can learn more at factory45.co. Um, if you're interested in launching a brand with us or just want to sort of explore the opportunity, you can book a call with our director of enrollment, Hannah, um, and you can do that and just get on a call and have a conversation, see if, see if it's the right fit for your business goals. Yeah. And the great thing about fashion, let's be honest, is that it doesn't matter how saturated the market becomes, tastes change, uh, you know, fads come in. So there's always niches come up that you never thought about before. So despite it being a crowded market, there's always, always lots of opportunity. 
Oh, always. And we saw that with the pandemic, right? Like loungewear went through the roof. So. <laughs> yeah, Netflix wear, Netflix watching wear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, listen, thanks again, Shannon. Thank you for watching and listening. And we'll see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.